Uh, good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. And without much ado or further introduction, I'm, I'm sure he'll, he'll be talking about himself tonight. <laughs> Story Musgrave. <laughs> Should I tell them where we were before we came over? <laughs> we were <laughs> out having a few. <laughs> I had to get over to stage right. <clears throat> and also, this engine don't run without fuel, so here we are. <clears throat> is it loud enough, Tom? Is that, is, how's the back of the room? We talking all right? <clears throat> okay. So, and you can dim the lights too of, along the way, Tom, because they got the glare going back their way. <clears throat> so I really, uh, I'm incredibly glad to be here. I can't say it's always luck. I was in Pasadena for Pathfinder and for Spirit and for Opportunity Landings. And so I guess it's, uh, it's more than luck that I keep ending up out here when, when good things are happening. <clears throat> but I want to thank the Society uh, very much for the privilege opportunity of talking to y'all on an important uh, night uh, like tonight. <clears throat> so, um, I have never worked Mars. Um, I love Mars. Mars is a friendly place. It's just unbelievably friendly. The pictures are friendly, the atmosphere is friendly, you got to go somewhere, you might as well go someplace friendly. It's just, it's beautiful, right? But beautiful is very important. Beautiful is very important in terms of getting the public to get behind you and get there. <clears throat> if it's terribly cold and, and terribly isolated and, um, and not beautiful and it doesn't appear to be friendly, that's going to be harder to, to get the support to uh, go there. But I've done other things in life. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> I have not worked Mars, and you all have, and you've been working it all week here. Uh, so I've been doing other things, and um, also, so you got Mars, and then you got Washington. That's Washington, D.C. So in that town, I am, of course, as you know me, I am not electable. I am not appointable, and for that matter, I'm not even relevant. So that's that. <clears throat> so without being an expert on Mars or in Washington, I don't have much to offer you. So I thought we might have fun. So we're going to have fun. You deserve to have fun tonight. It's a celebration tonight. And uh, Susan Holden Martin, I spoke with her. I thought about whether I should deal with project management and deal with how you make stuff happen and how stuff doesn't happen, you know, and all the rest of that. And I thought, you know, we are going to get into that in the panel that we have at um, 8845. So you'll get some of my perspective on how to make Mars happen, how I view how to make that thing happen, and I have some ideas on how to go about it. Not that much different from your Mars Direct and that kind of stuff, but <clears throat> we'll have a panel with some with Bob and uh, Richard Gott. Gotti, you, you in the audience? It's nice to see you again, sir. So he's, he's a grand man. We have a fantastic, it's, um, just really nice to catch up with you. Again, so we're going to have a, <clears throat> a great panel on. Uh, on human spaceflight, but as you'll see, I'm mostly a robotic spaceflight person, despite the fact I have flown in space six times and spent 30 years on the astronaut corps. Uh, someone left something here. Is there anything in it, or is it pure <laughs> water? <laughs> okay, <clears throat> now see if this engine runs out of gas before the... Anyhow, we're gonna have fun. Uh, so you deserve to have some fun. We're going to have fun tonight. Uh, we're going we're gonna to celebrate uh, MSL. We're going to celebrate uh, the biggest and the brightest and the best thing that we've <clears throat> ever landed on Mars. So we're going to have fun. But along the way, I'm also going to be um, educational. I'm going to tell you about stuff. Most of it human space flight because I have a personal experience with that. And so, but you are going to get my perspective on planetary exploration and, and Mars and doing things right and project management and the mission spirit and, and you know all that kind of stuff <clears throat> that's going to take us to get there. So you're going to catch a little bit of, uh, of my perspective too. But the, the, what we want to really do tonight is, uh, is to have fun. <clears throat> and that's the spirit of spaceflight, the beauty and the glory 
and the sacred. <clears throat> and that's good, Todd. You can get the lights off the screen. You already did it. You're reading my mind. Now, folks, that is the posture of exploration. Uh, so we're going to have fun, but I'm also going to be very serious. So you take a three-year-old kid and you drop them anywhere, and the kid is in the game for exploration, innocent pursuit of their universe and everything that's around, and this is why we do spaceflight. There's only one reason for spaceflight, human or robotic, and that is exploration. Exploration of the universe, the cosmos, Earth, our environment around. <clears throat> To answer the big questions as what kind of cosmos we got, what kind of place is this, where do humans fit in the place, what does it mean to be a human being, <clears throat> what's the meaning of the hope of the life we got here. So those are the real reasons, you know, for space flight, and we need to remember them. But this is exploration, that is the posture <clears throat> of exploration. <clears throat> now it happens to be me, uh, 75 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Didn't know that, did you? Uh, so that's me, <clears throat> and I fortunately got born on a 500-acre farm, a dairy farm in western Massachusetts, 100 head of uh, milk and currencies, but the thing is, it gave me 500 acres. And so I, I learned how to stretch mom even at the age of three. It's how long can I be out without her getting worried and come looking for me. So I'd stretch her, you know, a few minutes, a few hours until she didn't know where I was, and that's okay, because you're going to come home. <clears throat> I stretched it at the nighttime. I was in Pine Forest alone at age three, and, not, and that's far out. So people say, space flight, you know, no. A three-year-old kid in the middle of the forest alone at night, that's even further out in space flight. So how could she do that? A Pine Forest going to look after you. A Pine Forest, they've dropped the low limbs, not going to scratch your face, and you've got the wonderful needles, and it's warm, and it's friendly. It's just gorgeous. There's nothing in a Pine Forest that <clears throat> can hurt you. I built my own rafts, went down the rivers. At the age of five, I remember once about six or seven, Western Massachusetts cold, it's about minus 12 Fahrenheit. And I said, Mom, I'm going out. You know, Mom, she never asked. She, she didn't tell me stories cold out there. She didn't tell me that. She said, where are you going? She didn't know. What are you going to do? No, no. The kid said he's going out, so I'm going to button him all up. <clears throat> so she buttoned me all up. She had mittens, not gloves. Mittens. So she put a safety pin here and a safety pin on the other side. The, mitt the mittens going to stay on. You know, and she buttoned me all up tight. It's only been the last year or two I knew what mom was really trying to do. You know, she ain't just buttoned me up. You know what's going on? I can't pee. <clears throat> I can't get where I got to get. <clears throat> and if I do, I can't do nothing with it. Y'all didn't know what you're getting into tonight, did you? <clears throat> mom says, I'm going to get that kid home in an hour and a half. <clears throat> it's cold. I know how to get him home. <clears throat> so expiration. So it's fortunate that I got born into this world, that I had the opportunity, I had a space, I had a sandbox to go out and explore. And a lot of kids, you know, are only, only raised digital. You've got to think, kids only raised digital. They don't have the opportunity to get out in nature and to explore. They don't get out there with machinery. <clears throat> they don't get out there in a, in a physical world. So this is a gorgeous thing I did, an Indian uh, sent me by email. So it heard my presentation. And uh, I often show another child on the beach. Those of you that heard me before, remember my child on the beach, Richard? <clears throat> but he sent me this. So he, a wonderful graphic of a, of a child in the universe you know, holding a star in their hand. And uh, you just wonder what the child is thinking about. It has these kind of opportunities. But that, that's what we're about. That is what we're about there. And that's why we want to go to Mars. That is the fundamental reason. <clears throat> and that's the way we're going to move things. So, <clears throat> here's another child. I saw another child. So he could have been born in the U.S. He could have been born in the U.K. You don't know, he could have been born. But that's what destiny does to you. But he was born in Germany. So that's Werner von Braun that you're looking at right there. So it's an incredible story. That from as far back as he, <clears throat> or we can remember, he wanted space flight. So he's a dreamer, right? It starts with a dream. He was a dreamer. And he pursued space flight. And you see him as a teenager um, studying with Herman Oberth, who was the world's expert in rocketry. <clears throat> to 
the kid wanted space flight. He got a PhD in physics and he become, you know, the world's expert in, 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 uh, in rocketry. Uh, so, but World War II comes up, and so you know what they want him to do. <clears throat> they want him dropping V2s on London, and so that's what I had to do. And so some people criticize him for that. I don't. I knew the man incredibly well. We were spiritual brothers on the quest. And uh, he's serving his country <clears throat> like we all do. And, uh, and that's it. He's serving his country. He got in trouble a lot of times for a bad attitude. You know, he'd make statements like, man, my rockets are performing absolutely perfectly. The big problem is they're landing on the wrong planet. So he got, <clears throat> <coughs> he got trouble. Uh, so while he is, uh, when he is in the middle of uh, World War II, I'm on my farm in Western Massachusetts. And I, of course, I'm a farm kid, so I'm doing a farm today, right? And so I'm working 140 acres. I produce these wonderful green landscapes. I won't go too much on that because I need to finish by 1031. <clears throat> but that's the same tractor I drove when I'm nine years old. It's not the identical tractor, but a Farmwall M is what I drove <clears throat> when I was nine years old. So, you know, life does come around. Yeah, so I operate in the same tractor, but the kinesthetics and the motion and the vibes and everything else is just kind of fun when you're almost 80 you know, to be driving something you were driving when <clears throat> uh, you were nine years old. That kind of brings you back that far. And of course, I got on eBay. <coughs> eBay's where you get these kind of things. Uh, so I flushed fuel out of the tank and the carburetor, put fresh fuel in, hit the start button, and started. It's run ever since. I got a fully operational tractor, only paid $2,000. You can't even buy a riding lawnmower for two thousand dollars, but it's why I do in life. <clears throat> now, a farm, my farm was very, very important uh, to me. And so um, I rode the bales at five, age five, because they couldn't tie the knots. The rectangular square bales coming down, you know, it would just collapse out the other end because the twine in the 1930s, 1930s. So <clears throat> kids always ask me, but adults, even your adults, ask me a story. You always want to be an astronaut? I have to remind him in the 1930s, I don't want to be an astronaut. You know, if I had a big problem, if I wanted to be an astronaut in the 1930s, <clears throat> because there were none, I wanted to be a farmer back then. But they positioned me on the baler where I tied the knots if the machine couldn't. Uh, so that was my first start in farming. By the age of nine, I drove every track to every truck in the place. By 12 or 13, left in remote fields with heavy equipment alone, I learned how to keep stuff going when it was broken. That's who I am. A magician with equipment. Now you know where the story going. I was also a lead mechanic to fix, repair Hubble Space Telescope. I designed Hubble for 18 years. I went to fix it. Why? I'm a farm kid. Don't forget the story. <clears throat> you think a farm kid not going anywhere. A farm kid is. <clears throat> but back then, bus left me off at the barn, picked me up at the barn. I had no homework, no books. I had real responsibility on the farm and I had my wonderful nature, my exploration. So the abstractness of books could not hold on to me. So me and books part of the company. I never finished school. <clears throat> I never even finished school. But uh, Korea came up. I'm sorry for the resolution. I got lousy resolution on a big screen like this because the kind of cameras we had in 1951, not so good. You know, you got to click. You had, I got nothing. So my resolution, not so good in 1951 here. <clears throat> but that's amazing. So I ran off to Korea with the Marines, and they made me a mechanic, already a mechanic. So they made me an airplane mechanic. I started off as electrician, instrument technician, then I ended up being engine mechanic. That's a Douglas AD Sky Raider that we got there. And that's where I worked out there. Now, I did not have a wonderful hangar. We didn't have hangars at all. We didn't even have runways. We flew off the steel manning, but I had to work. I had to work in the mud and the snow on complicated gear and complicated engine stuff. So you see, it's really nice if you've got a hangar <clears throat> and it's somewhat conditioned and you can lay things out, but I did not. And so. But within months, I became a crew chief. But in the Marines, I was unbelievably creative in diagnosis what needed to be done with this airplane and keep it going. What's wrong with it, you know? But I knew right off, you never touch airplane. You don't touch an airplane unless it's exactly the way they taught you or by the manual. Because it is a pedigree of process. There is a history of works. You, you're not creative in touching the airplane. Otherwise, you're an engineer, which you're not. So there's only one way to touch an airplane, and that's the right way, <clears throat> the proven way that's proven to work. So I learned that, I learned that right off. <clears throat> so this is what it's about back then, that's the early 50s. 
And it's a prim this looks like some other lifetime. Well, it's 60 years ago, so it was some other lifetime. And so I'm 17, I'm 17 doing this kind of stuff. And I hope someday we don't have to do this, you know? I hope someday we won't have wars, that we can achieve a peaceful global community in which we're getting balanced with other creatures of the world and, you know, sustainable behavior with only lifeboat earth that we're ever going to have. <clears throat> and so I just hope that sometime we'll be able to achieve the species will get along with itself. Now I started flying in the right seat of this AD Sky Radio. There was a right seat. And you see the dive brakes hanging on the bottom. So we had guided nothing. You know, we didn't have guided bombs. We didn't have guided rockets. We had rockets, 2,000 pounders. But when you dropped them off, they ignited, and wherever they were aiming, where you dropped them off, that's where they went. The bombs, they just fell, you know, whatever trajectory. <clears throat> the most accurate thing we could do would be absolutely vertical. If you're absolutely vertical, straight down on the targets, if you're totally, you just drop them off, and they fall into the target. And so it's the most accurate possible thing you can do. <clears throat> So I'm flying the right seat, and I got these kids. The pilots, you know, I'm 17, they're 21 or 22, and we're immortal. You know, you know what immortality is? We are immortal, you can't kill us, we don't think. The pilots are so interested, they're flying after the bombs. They're following the bombs on down to see if they hit the target, and I have to scream at them, hey guys, we're not the bomb. Hey, you know, you gotta pull out. Stop, stop doing this. And so, <clears throat> Uh, so that's me. That's me back then. And as a crew chief now, so I became a crew chief within months as a mechanic. A crew chief, they handed me three airplanes. Private Musgrave, three airplanes, they're yours. I did the maintenance on them, on a big R3350, the right engine, 3,000 horsepower, compound engine, and the rest of it, I coordinated the rest of the men, and it's me. They signed off 300 items, and I sent them to war. I said, this airplane is certified ready to go to war. It's okay for flight, and I did this at 18. You know what 18 year old is? They're different these days. <laughs> 18, I signed them off. The pilots are looking at me, and I look about 16, you know, and they said, my goodness, they taking care of this airplane. <clears throat> yeah, so, but out of, after Korea, we headed, by, headed out for a carrier, so that's going by Mount Fuji. We're gonna have fun tonight, so I'm gonna bring you just gorgeous, uh, now, gorgeous images. Now, this is outrageous good stuff. This is just fun good stuff. So a lot of you are in airplanes, right? So we're doing airspace. You're into airplanes. Airplane spacecraft. Now, so there's AD Sky Reader coming into the WASP. That's my airplane. I own that airplane. So I own this airplane right there. I own it. I strapped the pilot in and send them off. I send them off and that's it. And my airplane, my engine, got to perform. And so this is the old days before the catapult. This is outrageously romantic. It's just unbelievable, see? You don't have a steam catapult in the cables. <clears throat> this is the wasp. We were, we were very late getting uh, the canted deck and getting the catapult. So we're straight deck, and you just fly them off, and you hope we get to end. You got enough energy to go fly. <clears throat> but this my life is about. And that's the way I've been raising It's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. Well, that kind of stuff right there. Uh, so, now uh, this one didn't get enough out of the system. Now, he's going to get out. But very ironic, my brother, who was on the same carrier, two years later flying the same AD Sky Raider, he went in the water, but he didn't get out because the carrier ran over him. Uh, so, but that's, you know, that's who I am. That's what I've been doing. Uh, so, I left the Marines because out of high school diploma, you know, I can't really do anything at all. So, I took up flying for serious. I owned a 172. I got all my ratings, charter pilot, flight instructor, all that kind of stuff. This is my Beechcraft T-34. I said T-34A in, uh, in Air Force Air Force colors. And I did air shows, Blanca, AKC. We got some people do air shows, aerobatics stuff. So I taught aerobatics, but I also did, <clears throat> I did air shows. You know how you do an air show? You do an air show on your thigh right there. That's the page. The first sheet is what you're going to do approaching the airport. The next sheet is the first maneuver. It's a diagram of the maneuver and the airspeed and altitude you're going to hit all along the way. That's it. You don't do anything else. You just keep turning the page and that's what you do. If you miss the airspeed or altitude you abort automatically, that's it. It's over. <clears throat> the only way to do air shows. So you know the Paris Air Show? Per hour of flying, the Paris Air Show got the worst record of any institution on this earth. 
They've done everything. They've done supersonic transports. They've done Airbus and F-18. Every airplane that's ever come into being got crashed at the Paris Air Show. I guess that's what it takes <clears throat> to sell it to the customer. But I don't know. We're going to have fun tonight. But, you know, it's a bad record. i got to get So you got to do those kind of things right, but I, I did them right. I also did sailplanes, and uh, so I got real serious about sailplanes, got my rating, and I designed sailplane instrumentation systems, which are really critical to how far you're going to go in life. I got the first Lark, the Romanian IS-28 B2, to come in the country. I got the third one. The dealers got the first two. <clears throat> it was the highest, uh, highest performance uh, uh, two-place sailplane in the world at that time. That particular airplane I designed the instrumentation, that airplane, my airplane there, uh, set three United States records. Uh, so that's the good news is. The bad news is I was not in a sailplane when it set the records. I lent my sailplane to a friend for the weekend. <laughs> I was glad he did it. <laughs> so. Well, that's a, that's a great world, that business there. I'm also a parachutist. I got a thousand jumps, and um, I got a hundred experimental free falls. Um, just establishing the aerodynamics of the human flying body, the, the human as an airplane, the best L over Ds and the opening shocks and all the rest of the stuff. And so the data I got way back in 1962 is within one or two percent of the best data they're getting today. So I did a good job. <clears throat> In, uh, in my scientific research, but I have no stories to tell you. I, I don't have any stories to tell you about parachuting. All a thousand jumps, I opened at the right altitude above where I wanted to every time. So you just, you, you do knowledge capture. You look at the way people do it, you read the books, you get the procedures, you get the checklist, you build a checklist, and then you follow it. <clears throat> and you update the checklist if you get a better idea and it's proven it out in the industry and in the community. <clears throat> you just do it right. You have to do it right. In most parts of the world, um, things are okay until things go bad. In the parachuting world, things are not okay until something happens. That's this, you know, so. Anyway, <clears throat> another world I had. Uh, so that's why I went to college in. <laughs> you see how the story's unfolding, right? You don't drive a car like that, you fly a car like that, and you gotta tinker with it, you know? Uh, so, but I did go off to college, I begged my way into college. First degree is in mathematics, complex variables, multivariate analysis, probability. I'm talking too fast, aren't I, ma'am? It's, what, it's a terrible language I'm using too, right? <laughs> I'll try to slow down. Uh, but we got 1031, I gotta finish. <clears throat> so. <laughs> well, I want to. I want to tease you a little bit, ma'am. Are you teasable? Um, I'll, 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 i work on you a little bit too. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, so, um, the first degree was complex mathematics. I went to work for Eastman Kodak as a mathematician, and then I went to UCLA in, in computer programming operations research, and that is the mathematics of business, the mathematics of industry. But from there, I got interested in how the brain works. And so it's a fork in the road, it's a twist. I'm on the ground floor of an incredible thing, you know, stuff. And so we had vacuum tubes in the computers. There's no one in this room. No one knows what a vacuum tube is. You know what a vacuum tube is, sir? No, you don't know what a vacuum tube is. How can you possibly know? For God's sake, you're not even 30. <laughs> how do you know what a vacuum tube is, you know? Okay. They were vacuum tubes and magnetic cores. And that's what the computers are made of, the size of a building back then. But I got to understand how the brain works. And so, you see what I got for you tonight. Another theme that's running is personal development. It's how you design a life. It's how you design a life. And so, things happen. New technologies, new jobs come along. You're interested in computers, you know, you understand how they work, but how's the brain work? You shoot over here. So, I'm really talking about design a life. So, that's another theme I have in addition to uh, the glory and the beauty and the sacred of, of space flight. So running through the theme here <clears throat> will be how you develop a life. 
and it's not over. I reinvent myself in my, as, as I approach 80. But this is why I went off to school and it's a story. You went to college and how could you possibly afford something like, well, it's $2,800 back then with everything. The biggest motor and the biggest everything was only 2800 But I'm making so much money going to college, I have to spend it on something. I'm looking for some place to spend it, so I spend it on that. And so I was a walk on the wrestling team and I was undefeated in high school. I was undefeated in high school. Why? Because I lift a thousand bales. I lift a thousand bales. You know, I lift thousands. Huh? Who, who like this? You? You? Well, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> but anyway, it's just life. I lifted thousands of hay bales bigger than me. So on the wrestling team, man, if I got a hold of you, it was over. There's no way, there's no way you can deal with a farm kid been doing thousands of bales. And so I see the way life unfolds. You connect the dots to the past. What am I good at? What am I strong at? What kind of experiences I had? So the farm kid looked after the wrestling. So the wrestling, I walk on at the university, room, board, and tuition. I got everything paid for. I said, that's neat, but the GI Bill is also paying. The GI Bill from Korea is paying for everything also. So I got two people paying for everything, and I'm working. Now, so I'm making so much money, I got to do this kind of thing here. So that's the first dual headlight, uh, Corvette 958. I saw I've been doing Corvettes basically ever since. But it's, uh, the Corvette's very important because you fly it, you don't drive it, and you got to tinker with it. You know, there's no way, there's no way you cannot go under the hood and mess with a darn thing. And so it's keeping my skills going as a, as a mechanic along the way. And so then off the, off the pre-med, I had no pre-med, so back into pre-med, then to medical school, Columbia, and New York City. Now, so that's where I'm going. I'm going to neurosurgery, I'm going to neurophysiology. That's where I'm going to be. I, got, I think I've got a good career uh, going here. So that's a focus, concentration in the moment, a good technology. That's where I think I'm, I'm going to go. But oh dear, <laughs> Sputnik goes up and I'm in medical school. I don't know what that means to me. It's interesting, it's fascinating. We got some satellite uh, going up there. So, but you know Sputnik. Yeah, so, but Von Braun, Von Braun, we left him over there dropping V2s on London in 1945 at the end of the war. He escaped from Pianomunda with 118 of his best to go and surrender to uh, American troop. He found one soldier, it was interesting, got 119 Germans trying to surrender to one soldier. He says, oh, I'll take you, come on. <laughs> so, Operation Paperclip, and he came to the uh, came to the U.S. with 118 of the best. And by the way, I keep up with four of the remaining 118. There's four left, and I visit with them. I email with. Them, I keep up with them. It's an incredible story what what those folks did, and so I just love sitting down, you know, and talking. Just four left out of a out of 118. It's just a just a wonderful, wonderful story. <clears throat> But, um, so he came here in 1945, and we didn't ask him to do space flight. The Germans asked him to do missiles, and we asked him to do missiles, see. So this is part of history not everyone knows about. We did not ask him to orbit something. We told him to do missiles. Uh, so he went from upgraded V2s into the Jupiter Sea, and he was cheating. Of course he's cheating. He cheated so bad they put ballast in the third and fourth stage of his rocket because he's going to get into space by accident, and he, w he didn't care. And it's pretty bad you go to apologize to the president, you know, by the way, sir, we're orbiting something. We didn't plan on doing it, but we missed in our calculations. But the important part about history is he'd have had us in 1950 if we turned this guy loose. So we'd have been there seven years before Sputnik. So it's an important thing and it's important to Mars. It is what is, what is your vision? What is important about spaceflight? Is it exploration? Is it romance? It is history. It is who we are as human beings. We didn't understand that back then. So we didn't let him, hey, tell a guy to orbit us. Hey, we're going to go. We've got to go into space. You know, that's what he wanted to do, but we didn't turn him loose. And so that's an important part of history <clears throat> that not everybody understands. So we could have been there seven years uh, earlier. But then in response uh, to Sputnik, um, uh, NACA, well, we formed uh, NASA out of NACA, you know, starting in uh, about 1959, of course. Uh, uh, Sputnik went up in uh, 57, the fall of 57. Uh, so we formed uh, the NASA. And then we started, uh, you know, we had uh, disasters along the way. 
But when Von Braun was told, for God's sake, man, put us in space, it took him two months. <laughs> two months? He was ready, two months. So the vanguard and the rest didn't work. Told him to do it, he did it. And then we had a, you know, we started out with Mercury Redstone, as you well know, Shepard's first, so we had one suborbital flight. And then this guy, the guy was a nut, you know? <laughs> one suborbital flight, and he says, go, you're going to the moon, and you're going to do it in eight and a half years. Wow, man. But see, the date was urgency. The date was important, and he nailed the date. He gave us a slightly impossible date, but we pulled it off. So, in project management, the date you say when you got to be there and you got to get done with this job, the date is important. It can't be impossible, and it can't be too long. You need an urgency and a mission spirit. That mission spirit that says, golly, can't we get there? You know, it's a going to war kind of spirit, and it coalesces everyone and says, yeah, man, we're going to go do that thing. So the impossibility of the date just coalesces. We had the best project management the world has ever seen, and he stayed with us. He stayed with us all the way. He said to go, and he stayed with us. He visited the NASA sites. He visited NASA. It looked upon it as a personal, I own this project. He stayed with us. And he also, which has just really been communicated recently by Logson's book, is he was interested in joining with the Russians. <clears throat> in other words, going off to the moon together, which would have been super. Which would have been great for a lot of ways. It would have defused the international competition and we'd be in space for exploration, not just for international competition. So it's difficult when you come out of the 60s having won the ball game, hands down, are we still going to have a space program? It's difficult to come up with a vision. Now, so this man was, uh, he was just super. Go do the thing, and he stayed with us. He stayed with us through the Apollo fire. And he says, we're doing it because it's hard. And, uh, and he also had that vision of if we cooperate with a competition about Khrushchev, uh, did, not want to, did not want to do that. So it had an extraordinarily uh, successful Mercury program. I adore that picture there. And then, of course, uh, Gemini Titan, uh, the two-person crew. <clears throat> and this is the first rendezvous. This is Gemini 6 and 7, you remember? We're testing out rendezvous capabilities. So eventually, uh, the command and service mods will be able to uh, rendezvous with uh, Lunar Mod. I know you know all this history already, but it's nice to visit things. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's a fork in the road. <laughs> now, it's in Pasadena. Has anybody seen it? Did they take it down? Who's from? Huh? You seen it? It's in Pasadena, California. Or maybe they took it down. I don't know. But I saw this picture, fork in the road. <laughs> so, the fork in the road is at the end of the Gemini program, National Academy of Science and NASA are talking about flying people with a formal scientific education so they can propose experiments and conduct them in space. So I read about that in, in, in Science Magazine. And I says, oh no, golly no, no, no story. Don't do that. Now come on, you already got it. You've already been on your sixth career. Uh, <laughs> I got a wife and a bunch of kids. Oh no, here I go. I'm a space person. I'm going into space. So I left all my clinical training back in postdoc fellowship, graduate school, physiology of space, and that kind of stuff. It's a fork in the road, right? You come along, you're reading a book, science magazine. They want to fly scientists in space, and you look at yourself, everything I ever did in life, all my flying, all my mechanics, all my education, everything I ever did in life, that's it. Okay, we're doing that. Leave. Uh, leave that great path and back in the postdoc fellowship graduate school, so it's a fork in the road. So no one's seen that in Pasadena. That's how I read it. It's Pasadena, California, the fork in the road. So lots of prop time, but I got no jet time, so NASA sent me off to, um, to the Air Force to get, a year of, uh, get my Air Force wings, I fly with the Air Force. And so that was a glorious, that was just a super year, just a wonderful year uh, with the Air Force, uh, getting my Air Force wings and learning to to fly the airway, even though I had an ATP. <clears throat> I had all the FAA ratings, ATP flight instructor. I was a commercial pilot with a charter company, all the rest of that stuff. I just adored the Air Force and, uh, and learning their way about things. So I came back to NASA, and this is the airplane they gave us, uh, the NASA Northrop uh, T-38. And they gave us this airplane, you know, it's proficiency, you can keep it sharp. 
every second of the day be the best you can, how to be a professional in the aerospace world, the operating limitations, the procedures, the checklist, just be the best you can. That's why you got in this airplane. So they gave us the airplane. That's our flight proficiency airplane that you see there. But as, um, and that's a Northrop T-38, and this picture is 50 years old. 50 years old. So it's a design principle I'm talking about here. And so they keep putting contracts on the street to get their next supersonic, high-performance, training kind of logistical airplane. They look at what the contractor offers them. It's not as good as this. They keep doing this. It's been a, you know, it's going to fly until 2025 at least, 65 years old, because they can't improve upon it. They can't improve upon it because it's the most beautiful thing ever created, and it's so simple. So simplicity and beauty are business strategies, engineering strategies. And I teach them. I am a professor at Art Center College for Design, you know, up the hill from here. It's another job I have. Uh, so, <clears throat> but that airplane is a classical design triumph that you're looking at right there. It'll be a beauty of forever. And so, as soon as I saw that airplane and the beautiful place it's going to take me to, I said, okay, sorry, every time you go fly, you carry a camera. You don't get near the airplane without a camera. So I said, how do I add value to this gorgeous situation I've been put in, me and this airplane? It's a new playing field. So I always look at life as a playing field. You're on some playing field. You get thrust into some situation, you know, some condition. What are the rules of the game? What do I have to know to get to the finish line? What do I have to know to get to the outcome? And over the decades, I've gotten pretty good at that. But I saw this airplane, and the airplane deserves you know, to have a camera and the beautiful place it'll take me. So I always carried a camera you know, when I went in the airplane. So it is one gorgeous subject to, uh, uh, to photograph. Yeah, this is spectacular. Now, people look at my book. Yes, I didn't know where I'm going with all these photographs, but after 10,000 pictures, I said, time to do a book. So I did 10,000. So I did a book on the NASA Northam T-38. Uh, so here I'm digital, and people look at my book and say, Story, you don't, you don't deserve any of that. You don't, that just got handed to you. It did get handed to me, but give me just one little bit of credit. I was there and I had a camera. <laughs> <laughs> there and I had a camera. It's a sunset going on. It's the optical characteristics of the glass and the circular polarizing filter that I have, you know, for stray and sharp light, not for these purposes, but those three things taken together gave me this incredible rainbow that gives me the structural, the structural characteristics of the canopy. All I did was stalk it. <clears throat> and of course, I started shooting Nikon film, then Hasselblad film, and I went digital as soon as I could, but only digital would have allowed me to get this picture. You know, because of course, as you well know, digital tells you, did you get the picture, did you not get it? If you didn't, what do, what do I have to change? So digital is magical. But also, when you got Hasselblad, you can't shoot 100 just to cover your tail and get the picture. You can't afford 100 Hasselblad films. So, you know, that's what that's about. And so that is my, um, that is my cathedral. That's my cathedral picture. So that was a UPS building. UPS had an airplane that had to fix. They built the building because so I had the mechanics put the airplanes in their buildings. See? So that's stained glass windows. It's not. It's only scaffolding, but you see what I'm trying to do. That's my cathedral kind of picture. You're looking at a beautiful reflection on the tail. So at this point, I know I'm doing a, know I'm doing a book. Hurricane Ike, uh, I moved that building to somewhere else and did not set it down gently, so that, that's gone. I was a maintenance test pilot on this airplane for NASA, too. A maintenance test pilot is one when an airplane been under heavy maintenance, you know, serious maintenance, critical stuff like the engines, the hydraulic system, flight control and things, or a periodic inspection, got piece all over the floor. You scoop all the pieces, put them back together, and I fly to see if it works. <clears throat> That's what I did. Do you know, in 800 functional check flights on an airplane, 800, I never found one thing that the pilots omitted, and I never found one thing they did wrong. That is extraordinary maintenance. So you say, well, what function you, well, what I'm doing is this, if you're going supersonic and you, you feel a buzz, you feel the buzz, well, you pull it right dial and bring it home. You don't, you don't do buzz and flutter. That's not something you see a flight control service, you know. You bring it home. Or you shut the engines off and you're coming down altitude. They're supposed to, by spec, start at 28,000 feet. If they don't, bring it home and tell them. So that's stuff they can't test. But that's the best flying I ever did because it's by specification. Now, so, folks, this is the business you are all eyeing in. We're, we're in this business here. It's just gorgeous. 
its aesthetics and its flight and its speed and its motion, it's going, it's up in the air. Uh, so it's the human dream. You know, see, that's the human dream you're looking at uh, right there. Now, this is what NASA wants you to do. They want you to press yourself in the airplane. They want you to push yourself hard. That's Mother Earth, of course, right there. Yeah, so um, they don't want you just cruising around at altitude. They want you to push yourself hard. Because the harder you push yourself in the airplane within the correct limits, the more you're going to get out of this situation. So they want you doing this. You're seeing some stars in the background fairly high. Now, you do understand these formation pictures. I'm not in that airplane. I'm in this one over here, <laughs> taking a picture. Sometimes I have a pilot, sometimes I don't. And they look over at me, and I got two hands on a the camera. They wonder who fly in the airplane. <laughs> so a lot of people wouldn't fly with me, but you remember the rule. You always bring a camera. Now, value added to the situation. And so, you know, straight up, you keep going straight up, you know what comes next? You know what has to happen? If you keep going straight up, the real estate people know. You go straight up long enough, this is what's going to happen. So you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> the real estate people get my message. <laughs> Talking to themselves, <laughs> you know, what else? You got to pay attention now because this, you're 10 miles a minute straight at Mother Earth. You have to laugh. You know, you look at Mother Earth 10 miles a minute. That's just a heck of a ride, man. But you got to pay attention to physics. You have to pay attention to physics. You think a mile and a half above Earth, it's okay. It's not okay. You have to pay attention. It's vigilance and awareness and doing things right. All right so here's a pullout. That's about a 7G pull out over the Gulf of Mexico. Now, sorry for the blur, but I got 7Gs. <laughs> I don't have autofocus back then. <laughs> I have to manual focus. And turning in this direction, I cannot get my eye on the eyepiece. So how am I doing it? I'm judging how far away I am from that airplane and putting that on the focus ring. So it's tough. Plus, I got a mask, got a helmet. I can barely hold a camera. So anyway, some of it comes out, but you got to pay attention. And so that's ASA 64. I saw I not, should not have been able to get that. No one in this room knows what ASA is, do you? you know? Oh, you, I got people that know way back, yeah, ASA. Now, so, OK, now, so we're having a huge amount of fun here. Uh, so now people, you know, people look at my book and they say, "Story, you didn't deserve this one either. You just you're cheating." So you're cheating. Well, I am cheating. I had the mechanics pull this wonderful flight line. That's a shuttle train airplane. I'll talk to later. But see at the top, that's a shuttle up there. That's a launch pad, and it's going to be a night launch. So what I'm planning is here the shuttle go up at night and light up my babies, right? Because <laughs> I know I'm doing a book now. Yes, this is cheating. Yeah, it's cheating. There you go. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> well, it's okay to cheat, right? <laughs> so, we, are we having fun tonight? We're having fun with airspace. And so, here's a, here's a daytime, same thing, except it's, it's launch pad A at the case here. A lot of my pictures I got from riding the lift around. But I saw that, it's really neat. But you're going to watch what happens now. Can you believe the plume did this? Now, you all know about some plumes. You've probably seen them. Vandenberg creates some unbelievable plumes. Somehow, and I don't know the physics, the plume wraps around itself into a three-dimensional structure. A plume cloud should disperse like this, but in this case, it wraps around itself like that. Uh, so, my goodness. I'm there, and I got a, I'm got there, I got a camera, of course, and you see the sun, the sun is starting to set by the color here. Gee, it's just outrageous. So I got T-38s to pardon in the sunset, and I got that overhead. That's a story. I don't deserve any part of that thing. It's just luck out. I was there at a camera, okay? Now, if you think I'm good with Photoshop, <laughs> SDS-117 launch images. Yeah, so does all the people that went to that launch. And by the way, I'm leaving a PowerPoint with organization. So the show I'm giving you, you can take it with you. If the organization, Mars Society, I give you the, this show, take it with you. It's on those pictures there. But so that's what happened with STS 117. It's just unbelievable. But the timing, and the sun is always cooperating. It always cooperates for me. It's the right place at the right time for what I got to do. So it's just, uh, yeah, it's just it's, uh, what it's all about. 
It's what it's all about. Being there. Being there doing the best you can without us. So that's STS 117. Now, I parked a T-38 out there and I asked them, this is a shuttle landing, the shuttle just landed, and I asked them so I can get a picture. If they drive the shuttle by my airplane, drive it by. Story, you don't deserve that either. Well, I asked them to and they said, of course. So they drove the shuttle by and you see the parallelism of the tails and the wonderful uh, vehicle assembly build. So in terms of iconography, maybe that's the most powerful picture. I've got a hundred others of this airplane and the shuttle by. <coughs> I do like that one there. Now this is not believable. Well, I don't believe it either. Ellington Field, Houston, Texas. It's on a Sunday, that's why no one's at the flight line. I parked my beauty, put my gear away, went to the car to leave, and I turned around backwards saying goodbye to my beauties and this in my face. The most powerful triple rainbow, the most powerful enclosed light I ever saw, and it's, you know, horizon to horizon right in the middle, right around there, I saw, you know. So the people say I don't deserve none of this. They really peeked out at this thing here. <laughs> but <clears throat> I backed up as far as I could. I'm up against the hangar, but I had to shoot the left and the right. See, NASA did a stitch. There's a little, there's a little bit stitch you can see right there. So that's an overlay to transparencies. But in my book, I'm digital, so I took care to, took care to stitch. But that is just, uh, just incredible. But when I saw that, you know, I almost died of fright. Did I leave any film in the camera? If you've got a Hasselblad and no film and you got this, you know, you never forget that. And why would I leave film for the flight line when I'm flying formation with people? But I had A-frames and I don't have them here. But I moved off to the left and the right. So I also have the rainbow coming right down through the middle of the, of the flight line there. So that's that. Now for the book and that's that for uh, the T-38, which I have been blessed with when I joined NASA. And I joined a, a few years before Apollo, and so now we move into, move into this incredible, magnificent, noble uh, machine, uh, which uh, Buzz is in the audience, which he flew, maybe someone else too. Buzz took it to the moon. But this is what I call uh, my cathedral picture. This is my church picture. So with a church and in, uh, in the steeple, you see up there. So it's technology and nature. Now the magic of, of Apollo and Saturn V was how simple and how robust and reliable the machine was. We had an eight and a half year date to get there. So the technology we picked, the moon imposes requirements upon you, or performance requirements. We picked the simplest way to get those performance requirements done. And that's important to go into Mars. It's what are the requirements imposed upon you by that mission and you come up with the simplest and most reliable, the most comprehensible way to get there. Not the most complex or you're gonna miss your date or you're gonna miss all kinds of stuff. So the magic of Apollo Saturn V was how simple and beautiful it was. And this happens to be Buzz's ship, Apollo 11 uh, on the way to the launch pad and the launch control center uh, you see over there. The right machine for the right job, yes. It's just gorgeous, noble just noble, An incredible machine, just spectacular. Uh, so there you go, and off we go. And uh, this is a later later mission to the moon, but there's, uh, there's Buzz of Footprint you see right there. That's, that's where we got, that's why we got there. Now, Dr. Von Braun went from an upgraded V2 called Jupiter C, he went to this in one big step. The man was unbelievable as an engineer, as a charismatic leader, as a presence, credible, authentic leader, project manager. He just simply did it. And even today, that is still the most reliable, most powerful rocket engine, and it's 50 years old, about 50 years old today. In a way, and I suppose it's a very difficult question, you wonder why we're not using it today. It's got his common sense, it's a kerosene burner, which I believe in for a first stage, a kerosene is totally cheap, it's almost not flammable, and it's not a cryogenic, you know, it keeps forever, but so, anyway. Yeah, so someone gasped? Who gasped? Yes, sir, it's exactly it. That, that's a gasp. We're not going to Mars until we have that kind of leader. Authentic, credible, it calls it the way it is, no compromises, and says we're going, and that's it. We're simply going, that's it. 
we need that form of leadership. We need that determination, that charisma, that leadership, and that kind of project management. Until we get that, I'm not sure how we're going to get there. So that's what you look at, the admiration for him. And uh, so I knew him very well. I met him, by the way, I flew the airplane. And so when he finally got to Marshall Space Flight Center, Redstone and Marshall, he had the top floor of the office building. He looked down on the Red, Redstone field uh, down there. And most T-38s that go by, they fly behind him. They go in a very wide downwind. They go out even two miles out, a square turn to base, a square turn to final, and they would drag it in and land. Every now and then, AT-38 would go by his window. I didn't know it was his window, but it's go by the window. It's a continual rolling turn to the runway. Boom. It's a continual rolling turn. So he sees this. And he says, what is this? He says, the one airplane different. Well, he was an ATP. You know, he was a very experienced, good pilot. But he can't stand it. After a while, he calls the airfield. Dr. Von Braun, what can we do for you, sir? Find out who just landed that airplane. It's a story. Musgrave asked him what he's doing for lunch. Okay. Every time he saw that, it's lunch. Now, so <laughs> a huge privilege that I got to understand that man and how he thought, how he project managed, you know, and how he's trying to how he's trying to get the job done. And so we put water, we put water, a huge water tank in there, because he knew we had to do it. So he read his science fiction. He was a dreamer. Forty foot of water. He no, he put it there. Now he didn't call it a facility because it takes congressional approval. If you're going to have a facility, he just wanted to build it. So don't call it a facility, just build it. You know, you know what it's like, forgiveness later. Uh, so that's why he did. He was the first person in a suit in a tank. He did zero G, he did the T-38. He was immersed in what he did, a true believer. Uh, so anyway, a huge love and, and respect for, uh, uh, for that man. Uh, so after Apollo, we went into the Skylab program, and so the Congress would not let us embark on any other program until we landed on the moon. Reasonable, but we built Skylab, our first space station, out of Apollo materials. And so that's an Apollo third stage you see there. So we had a third stage. We lived in an oxygen, uh, hydrogen tank. The oxygen tank was for waste. And we had a multiple dock adapter. Anyway, that was Skylab, immensely successful program, not very well known, 200 scientific experiments. That was our first experience with, a, with a, a space station. And you say, well, it's not very symmetrical. It should be a solar panel. You remember the story. That got ripped off in the launch. Uh, so they didn't, they didn't vent. So they missed on venting a tube, and the solar panel got, got uh, ripped off. And as did uh, the thermal protection cover, that's why we had to put manually put that sail out. So we were in a crash program to save this thing, to save it from the heat and to manage uh, manage the power. I was a backup crew member on uh, on the very first Skylab, immensely successful. Our first uh, our first space station program. Uh, so then we moved on. You like that one? <laughs> yeah. Well, sir, I hope you like them all. I work very hard on getting it, and it's important. Evocative, compelling images are incredibly important. If you've got a vision about why you're going to Mars, you need to build very compelling, evocative, multimedia images of what it's going to be about, the whole thing. This is what's going to happen when we get to Mars. And so that leads the public on, and you get pressure from downwards coming up to go and do this thing. So you need to, you know, create the whole darn thing. Uh, so compelling, and so right down the top. Now we came out of the 60s in a difficult situation because we came out of there saying we're, we're doing space to compete uh, with, the, with the Russians, but we're really not. It's exploration. That's why we're doing it. But we win it. We win it. And we went hands down, and so are we still going to have a space program? The NASA let the administration and the Congress force them into a defensive position. Are you still going to have a space program? So they started giving up the vision. The vision for space should be created by the NASA and space people, not by the administration and not by Congress. They should not be creating the vision because... <clears throat> <clears throat> now, because they're not visionaries, they manage things. They're the legislature, they manage the money, the revenue, and they manage all that. 
but they're not visionaries. And so we let von Braun go, or we pushed him out the door. Read the biography, but I also spoke with him. He said, it's over, story, I'm out, I'm gone. So six months after we landed on the moon, we disposed of the most valuable person that we possibly, you know, we really had to have moving out of the 60s that would give us the vision, the credibility, that would force the administration of Congress to go along with it. But maybe they forced him out, he's too strong because he is going to get his way. And we are going to Mars, and we're going to Mars now. You know, that's what he would have done. He would have done it right back then. But I don't know why they pushed him out the door, but we lost the real kind of visionary dreamer, engineer project manager that we desperately needed more then than ever when we came out of the 60s. So we started losing, the agency started losing being the visionary and handing that over to the place where the money came from. And so we got in the defensive posture and we let the congressional staff start to run, run NASA. And so it was tough from that point on. Now, we are trying to, you know, justify our space program, so we had to come up with a bus to keep everyone, 100% of everybody happy. So they imposed a whole bunch of requirements on it. It was tough back then. So we had to squeeze on a budget. We had to meet everyone's requirements, keep everybody happy to keep this space program alive. And so uh, the shuttle did not turn out quite as, as we expected. It was much more expensive. It was more fragile, more difficult to operate. It was just, it was tough. It was tough on a great agency, but I got to hand it to it. Uh, we we had our cultural problems at first, but we got it cleaned up. I got to hand it, this thing was a huge success, despite the cost and the fragility. If you look at the science, you look at the technology, maybe maybe it's difficult to operate made us good. You know, we are one heck of a spacefaring nation right now. We are an unbelievably good spacefaring nation. It's impossible to think of what we can't do because this machine, in a way, and the kind of payloads it carried made us tough, made us good. And so we're ready, we're posed. We're posed, we just need the marching orders to go. But the machine kind of did that for us, but it was, um, it was difficult. So to give you just some, some fun kind of stuff, that's the shuttle train airplane that we learned how to land a shuttle, that's your principal simulator. We did have simulators or virtual machines, but this is the real simulator, which is a virtual machine, it's an airplane, but it is a simulator. And so you see, now do you all know about this airplane? Maybe, well some of you know about everything. <laughs> the left hand side is a shuttle, and that's the glass cockpit shuttle. The right hand side is a business jet, a Gulfstream II. From 35,000 feet down then, you fly with shuttle controls and displays exactly like a shuttle. Now when you ask some, for some maneuver on the left hand side, when it's in a simulation mode, you ask for roll, say you want to roll it, you ask for a little roll like that, that talks to computers in the back of the airplane and, uh, and that airplane rolls the way a shuttle will roll based on its airspeed accelerations, you know, to fly envelope. So you fly on the left hand side and the best of its ability, the airplane will not fly like an airplane but like a shuttle. And that's why 100% of shuttle approach and landing staring out so good. Because we not only had a simulator but we flew through real air to the airports, particularly Kennedy and, uh, and California, and of course STS-3 was out at White Sands, but they all turned out. There was so much gypsum dust blowing around that uh, people did not want to go back to White Sands as good a landing place. So that's a shuttle train there. That's what she looks like. That's a 19 degree glide path that you're looking at. We got too many vibrations. We had to certify the airplane. We're in thrust reverse, of course. You can't make a business jet fly like a brick unless you're in thrust reverse. So I'm not allowed to use that language, you know, and it's, uh, but it's okay now. <laughs> like a brick, it is a brick. That's an L over D down around five. But that's, uh, that's White Sands, New Mexico, you see. Um, that is a DC-9, the poor airplanes. These airplanes, they put them through funny things. So this is the zero-G airplanes. You know about the parabolic flights we flew? Used to do this KC-135. That's a way back for decades we flew the KC-135. So you enter into a dive like that, and it's a two and a half G pull up, and once you're aiming up like that, very sensitive accelerometer, you just push over, and you're able to get 30 seconds of zero-G in the back of that airplane. Now very early on, like um, pre-Apollo and after Apollo, even getting into Skylab, we assumed nothing could work in zero-G because zero-G is singularity. 
It's not negative G, it's not positive G, but it's a singularity when things may not work. So we tested a whole bunch of things. We tested almost everything to be sure it would work. Now we don't test anything. Now we assume it will work unless proven otherwise. Unless you have some logic that says, yeah, that should not work, we don't test. And we've gotten away with it, it works just fine. So, but a different philosophy then. Uh, so that's a you know, characteristic story. That's a class of 78. So under the telescope, I just spent a short time on this, on the details and the fun. So back in 1975, you know, I was assigned to the, the Hubble Space Telescope. Boss called me in the store, yes sir, yeah, we're going to put a big telescope in, in, in space after Lyman Spencer's Princeton's idea. Finally, we're going to get to do that. And the boss said, story, you identify every possible failure that machine could get into and fix it with a spacewalk. Now, they could have said spacewalk or robotics. They did not. They said spacewalk. Since they didn't ask robotics, I can't spend extra money and all the time to do that. But that issue came up later when we didn't think we'd ever get back there after the Columbia accident. But anyway, 1975, they told me, to look after that telescope, identify every possible failure, and to come up with a spacewalking fix to get the job done. Well, that is a spacewalker, and man, that is not nice. Now, so you need the protection, of course, against the vacuum. That's why I got the suit. Well, a suit is bulky. Now, that's part of it. It's hugely bulky. But the other thing, real thing about a space suit, it doesn't have the same body you got. So I got a fantastic shoulder joint because my shoulder ball and socket, see? So that's why my 360, my shoulder joint, that's the good news is you ain't got a great shoulder joint. Bad news is your suit does not have a shoulder joint. It's only got a single bearing up here, just one bearing in one plane. So if you're doing this in the suit, you can't do that. If you're doing this, you have to rotate and then do this. So a lot of parts of the suit not got the same body you got. The suit got it body, you got your body, put the two together, you got to work in a different fashion. Uh, so you have that issue. The other thing is the suit has, uh, it has mass. Now we call it the free fall condition, we call it zero G, but as I know you all know, it's not zero G. The gravity out there about the same as it is uh, down here. Now, but it, uh, because you're in a free fall condition, is that velocity you have, you're still falling towards Earth, but you're going so fast. You are carried beyond the Earth as you fall. So that's really what it is out there. But, so you don't have weight, but you have mass. If you're trying to be a nimble little squirrel, you know, move where you gotta go, you gotta get 500 pounds going. 500 pounds, 480 for me. Me, I'm a suit, my 280 pound back bat, I'm moving 480 pounds. It takes a while to get it going. Now, if in your propelling yourself, you have not planned on the end, and you have no way to get stopped, you keep going. <laughs> and that is bad form. It is bad form to keep going. You find yourself alone <laughs> out there. <clears throat> but it's not something you worry about, because they'll come get you. It's bad form, but I have not lost a tool out there, but I've seen people lose tools. You're working away now, the tool protocol is, there's a toolbox, you open the door and the tool is tethered to the box. You take your tether off, hook it onto the tool, and then take the other one off. That's tether protocol where the tool is always a tethered to something. But I've seen tools get away. Uh oh. <laughs> and you yell, tool chase. <laughs> the words are tool chase. <laughs> that tells those wonderful pilots inside, ah, we gotta go get the tool. And so, if you wanna really tease them, you know, if you wanna see how good they are, you sit like this. You, you don't help them. You sit like this and they'll put the tool in your hand. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? <laughs> that. They'll put it in your hand. Now, if you see the tool going down there, you can save some fuel. And you go over there and get it. But if you want to tease them, you put the hand, they'll put the tool in your hand. So that is one unbelievable flying machine. Now, as you know, they're not flying the tool. The tool is going on its way at that velocity. They fly you up to the tool. That's what they're doing. So. In terms of, if you get loose, which is even worse form, <laughs> you don't yell body chase. <laughs> Tell the whole world. You just yell tool chase more urgently. <laughs> Come get you. So, now space station, they can't maneuver. And so you need a little jetpack, a little jetpack below your life support system. And uh, in, uh, in the case of space station, which cannot maneuver to come get you. 
And so, and that's loosens. But the other thing about it is everything is in constant motion and free fall. So, a spacewalking is bulk. It's a lack of dexterity. It's a lot of thickness, structural thickness, insulation thickness. It's not got the same body you got. It's got a lot of mass, maybe 480 pounds, and you're in a free fall condition which things dance all the time. So that is the difference between me working on a farm, me working on airplanes down here, and working out there in space. So I have to design. I come up with hundreds and hundreds of items that could fail, and then I come up with the zero-G space fix. So I look at how I'd work down here, but I have to use my imagination, my zero-G experience to do those tools and those procedures, 300 tools. So I did that. <clears throat> I did that for over, uh, over 15 years. This artist concept, the big camera, the Whitefield Planetary Camera, that came out of JPL here. And we've got people that participated in that. So Whitefield Planetary Camera too. But I use artist ideas how to do it. When I got real hardware, this is out in California, around Palo Alto, Sunnyvale there. I played with real hardware. So I would take real components out and put them back in. And I have script writers, you know, recording what I'm doing, photographers. And we kept converging on a final solution after 15 years. I think I got it all down. I think I can take care of absolutely everything <clears throat> that it could go wrong. Here's the real telescope uh, down at KSA, uh, getting ready to get launched. It is one spectacular, uh, beautiful uh, machine. And so here it is uh, in a canister on the way to the launch pad. But I really show you the picture for this beautiful little guy right here. To, He's saying, what are you guys doing now? Y'all is doing something. This is my world. What are you doing now? And so and that's SDS-31 mission it carried up. I did not carry it up there, but I was in communicating mission control. So I have 25 missions in mission control as the communicator. And so I got my own six flights, uh, too. But I like this one because you see the aperture door. You open up that door, light from the heavens going to the telescope. Here you got Mother Earth in the door up there. And so within two or three months, we had to fess up to the S word. It's called spherical aberration. What that means is we put the wrong mirror in the telescope. It was the world's most perfect one, but it was the wrong one. Uh, so along my 15 years of designing the uh, Hubble to be serviced, I could have had a line item that says NASA put wrong mirror in telescope, <laughs> but I wasn't cynical enough yet. <laughs> Got to do something about that. So. Anyway, I'll say how much, well, I've got to finish in 25. I'm not going to tell you the story, it's so good. But if you go to Hubble Mirror Accident Report, you get a 70-page PDF, and it, read it, please. It's how not to do business, just read it. So there's huge lessons in there. But quickly, very quickly, they're trying to calibrate a laser. So you want to be a very precise distance from the mirror. And this laser is going to run the polish machines, and when it cancels itself, you've got the right curvature. They've got to calibrate the laser. So they had a titanium rod and at a very precise temperature, they're going to bounce the laser off the rod and calibrate the laser for this distance. But obviously they have to protect the rod. They put a cap on, a black cap on top of the rod with a hole in the middle so the laser go down through the hole and bounce off the rod. Trouble is they didn't align the laser and they had abraded the cap. The laser coming off the cap, not the rod. So you have a measurement distance, not the rod, it's rod plus cap. They got all hacked off and angry. The laser will not behave because the laser is reading rod plus cap. And they can't make it behave. So they went to the hardware store and said, take this. And they shimmed the laser instrument. OK, that's it. Where are the procedures for its quality? There's no quality anywhere. They're not permitted. There's nobody anywhere. Do we tell anyone? No. So that's it. At the end of the ballgame, that's how it got. The story's much worse. Anyway, read about it. The story's worse. But we got a mission to fix 13 major things, the mirror and 12 other uh, major failures in the telescope. This is what it's all about. It's a space flight. It's all about the right kind of faces. Focus, concentration. It's like Apollo 13. It's like Kennedy said, go on the moon. You got a mission. You got a mission to do. And so the leadership is migratory. Different people lead. Who's, who's getting you there the fastest, you know? And you just got people like Terry and John here at Marshall Space Flight Center, the best in the business. They just do what they got to do, and they're on, everyone on the same page to get this thing done. And so we do use water as a simulator, and so, and Buzz on, back on Germany helped to invent how we would use um, water back in Building 5 at, um, at JSC. Water does allow you three-dimensional freedom to move around as you will in, uh, 
in zero G. It's good for what can I reach. It's good for can I get my eyes where I got to to see. It's good for moving big objects around. What is the translation path? What it is not good for is how a suit going to work. In space, my suit, of course, is floating perfect. And in space, I float inside my suit. So I'm hardly in contact with my suit because everybody floating. That's not water. Water's neutral buoyancy. If I go upside down on my suit, I got 170 pounds on my collarbone. And so the suit doesn't work anything in the water tank the way it's going to work in space. So your, your ability, your ergonomic ability to do work in a suit, even if you're tipped over a little bit like this, it's not the same. So water is not a simulator. It helps. So we use a lot of analog devices to get the message. Now, I always empower the divers to speak up. If they see a better way for me to do buying business, you know, show me. You reach and show me with your hands, you know, how you're going to do that thing. And so that's an engineering qualification unit in the Smithsonian. Maybe some of you have seen this. But I'm worried about the metrology. I'm worried about the measurements and the mock-up they're giving me. And so I knew this engineering qualification unit was guaranteed to have the same measurements, the same size as Hubble. So I took my instruments, that's an instrument I'm going to take out in space, and I would take whatever I could to the Smithsonian to do fit and function. It doesn't fit and doesn't function, and of course I teach my body to do the same job. I'm going to the vacuum chamber tomorrow, so this rehearsal here, to practice with as many tools and as many instruments as I can in a vacuum chamber at flight temperatures. So that's as close we're going to get to the real thing. At the best vacuum we can at the anticipated flight temperatures. Now, what's temperature in space? So temperature in Pasadena is you, you take a thermometer out and you measure the air temperature in Pasadena, but space got nowhere. But to make the problem simple, space is pure radiative exchange. Me, spacewalker, I want Mother Earth. I want a huge face full of Mother Earth because on average, Earth 59 degrees. So we're summer here, the southern hemisphere, it's winter. You go night and day, you swap temperatures, but as you go around every hour and a half, you average temperature 59 Fahrenheit, and that's a gorgeous temperature. So if you give the spacewalker enough face full of Mother Earth, the surface of the suit will be 59 degrees, and that's a gorgeous temperature. But <clears throat> if I got the shuttle here, and Earth is out there behind the shuttle, and you give me the blackness of space, 3 degrees Kelvin, you're minus 4, you're out of the game 15 minutes. You're out of the game because that's the background temperature from the Big Bang. All he goes out and keeps coming. It never comes back. So <clears throat> in designing this mission, now, Hubble says no sunlight in any open door. We can't do that. And at times, I had three open doors. So that complexes. You got a pointer that says what attitude you're going to point at. Now, also, the shuttle wants to point its antennas at the tracking data real satellite. And the person got a fuel, don't want to spend fuel. He wants one attitude, the whole spacewalk. He won't spend any gas. Well, I want to get home too, but I need some gas to get warm. Okay. So I'm highly constrained. And so it came out on me. And so all the constraints didn't give me enough Mother Earth. And so I ended up running at minus 170 Fahrenheit. My tools, I didn't design the tools for minus 170. 50% of my tools came from the hardware store unmodified. Another 25% modified tools. I tried to be simple. <clears throat> but it stung so bad, I had to take temperature breaks. I told the test conductor, I got temperature bias. Fingers are stinging. They're stinging too bad. I got some insulation, but not that good. And the tools didn't like what was going on. So I had to squeeze down the tools. That made the contact even worse. And so it's not going well. But at the eight hour point in this test, and it's a 13 hour test, at eight hour point in the test, my hands didn't sting anymore. You got that message? Yeah, you know what's going on because they're dead. So I got eight dead fingers. You see the, the demarcation. And when I got out of the vacuum chambers, got out, they were dead, you know, already black when I got out. So they sent me to Alaska the next day, and uh, he was, you know, because a world frostbite expert up there, he was optimistic about how much I was going to lose. And so, but I'm six months before flight. Uh, so this is, this is not good, six months before flight. But I still haven't developed the mission. It's not just training. I need to develop the dance. I'm still working on developing the final, every finger, every toe, every move I'm going to make. So I got back from up there, got back in a suit. And I said, I'm not happy about that. I said, story, this stuff's going, you can't get a suit with that. Hand like that's going to fall off. I said, if it falls off, I'll shorten the gloves. You know, just shorten the gloves. So, but you know, what, what am I to do? 
I ask now, what am I, what am I supposed to do? I got to keep going. If it falls off, it's my problem. That's what I asked that. But anyway, so we got the problem. We put heat in the gloves, but you got to give NASA credit for this. They dedicate them resources to test. We found the problem ahead of time. We heated the gloves and we found some more fuel so we could do maneuvering. When I went to fly this mission toasty warm the whole time, I never had to think about temperature. When I flew STS-61, just like that, toasty warm the whole time. But a little bit of humor. You know the clear program where you give your biometrics at the airport? You become a registered travel, you give your biometrics, your eyeballs and your fingerprints. So I gave them all that. I got a certified letter back from those people. They said, Mr. Musgrave, where you have fingerprints, they're indicative of someone trying to hide their identity. <laughs> You need to come in and talk to us. We've got to find out who you really are. <laughs> so anyway, <it's laughs> here we are, arriving down at, at Candy here. That's the Hubble crew you're looking at, a flying a formation. Uh, so, yeah, the bird's eye view is spectacular. That's what we're about. That's what we space people are about. I keep looking at the clock. I'm going to finish at 8.30. I'm going to sit down whether or not I'm done. Launch pads A and B. Uh, this is what it's about, folks. Yeah, you get permission to fly by this beautiful vehicle, T-38, and buy the launch pad. Now, some of you have probably noticed we have two shuttles. So I mix and match my images to give you the best I got. But it's STS-125, and we need to have, you know, a backup vehicle. Because after the Columbia accident, it said we, we always want to get to space station. Because Hubble and space station, different plane. If you go to Hubble, you can't make it to space station. So we had a rescue. We had a, so we had we got vehicles on both pads. There, if you notice that, your vehicle left California a few months earlier, flew across the desert. Uh, just spectacular stuff. And if you look at the history of how we ended up uh, putting a shuttle on a 747, originally we were going to mount jet engines on the top of the wings. Was one of the alternative the concepts early, and we'd actually fly it through the air like an airplane. But that would have been massively complex handling qualities and all. But a fellow got that idea, and he was a fellow who was an expert in remote-controlled airplanes. So he built a Model 747 a shuttle, and NASA says that's the way we do it. Uh, so this is beautiful. We'll just stack that thing up. And this is just gorgeous. This is Discovery's last flight. So you see, I'm, this is not Hubble. I'm just giving you the best images I got. And they really put the lights on it and did, a, did an incredible thing. Uh, so this is uh, going out to the pad with a sunrise over the Atlantic and a sunset uh, with a pad. And I love the reflections and af right after the rain, the reflections of that when I always visit my ship and not before I go into space. Then I go out and swim in the water to stay in contact with Earth. Now you wake up launch day, this is not what you want to see out the window. This is, this is not the kind of day you want. You certainly don't want this kind of stuff. So... These are real pictures. It didn't happen to me. I had good days for the most part. So we're going to drive down the road in the van. You know that, but you're trying to stay in contact. So you know you've been there. You see the great big eagle's nest and over the years, over the decades, the eagle's nest. You check on them, see it's okay. And you turn right at the vehicle assembly building. You head out to the launch pad and check some other friends you got out there. <laughs> yeah, this is Candy Space Center. It's just unbelievable. Uh, check your buddy, so. When you work down there and you're heading for the parking lot, you look around in the, in the evening because uh, if they had a bad day, they expect you to improve upon their day, you know, so. Uh, so, now uh, there's, uh, there's Troy. So Troy and me, he's my suit tech. He's, he takes my gloves, my helmet, my suit, my life support. He takes my oxygen bottles, my parachute, the whole thing. I went on a journey with him for 30 years. He put me on Apollo when I trained for Skylab. He put me in the water tank, the vacuum chambers. He put me on six shuttles. That's it, folks. That is two folks who went on a journey together that you're looking at right there. That is professionals. Every time we came together, we tried to do a little better. Now, I like this one here because there's no technology. Because the human reach for the heavens, you see, is framed in nature. Reminds you of 2001. This is a pure push. Now, people mail me these. So this is a timed exposure digital camera. But I don't know, someone just mailed me this, how you like this story? Well, I like it, I just love it, so yeah. <laughs> so, you don't deserve this one either, story. Yes, somebody emailed me this one too, how you like this one, story? So, just beautiful, man, people looking after me. 
you can't be good, be lucky. We're in space. We go chase that Hubble down. I know you've seen this at sunset. Yeah. So chase it down and uh, run the rendezvous on a personal computer. That's what we did. So you tee into the data stream of the shuttle, do the solution in the personal computer, and then put it back into the system. So you're not scarring the shuttle. You can't change the shuttle. It's been up there tens, a hundred times, and uh, you don't want to, you want it to keep doing what it does. So personal computers were upgraded. Now here comes Hubble. You see there, got it in the back, go to work. And so after 18 years now, I'm going out the door and going to uh, repair that thing, and the kind of stuff I got to put up with is this kind of stuff here, you know. Now, NASA put the wrong mirror in the telescope, 13 other failures. You know, how do I feel going out the door? Do I feel any heat? I do not. I'm going to go out and do the dance. I'm happy with what I've built, the plan I've built. I'm going to go do it. But I bring inspiration out there. I bring the dream out there. And so this kid, she had no, no hope. She's from Siberia. She's from Siberia, no hope. And she and her dad said, we're going to play tennis. She won Wimbledon at 17. So that's it, folks. She got the dream. And Allison Barker, so I teach at Space Camp, 700 kids are all on the same page. They show up, why do they show up to get the job done? They know, what's, they know ahead of time, I'm going to be assigned a role. I'm going to learn the rules of the game, and I'm going to get good, and I'm going to get the job done. That's what it's all about, inspiration. I used to go out to this horse, Claiborne Farms, Paris, Kentucky. Get the horse all over me, and before I leave, I said, it's for you that I live, man. It's for you that I go forward. There's no reason to sign up for any less than that. You know, for you that I live. And it's a dream I didn't get to do. I always wanted to be a ski jumper. I love, I love velocity, I love soaring, I love aerodynamics, I love altitude. I didn't get to do that. So, but I went to Norway in April, and I sat on the bench just looking down the hill, wishing I could throw something out and go, you know. But I'm watching the skiers go, and one of them said, story, it ain't over till it's over, why don't you take it up now? Well, that's what it's about, see. That's what it's about, so. But I shouldn't feel too bad, I did get to do this. So. <laughs> 400 miles in the air over southern Australia, but here's, I say, just going to work on it, saying, here's the real team, the Mission Control. I love and respect, I adore them. And I mumble about how it goes. Where am I now and where am I trying to go? You see, I want them with me, I want to help. I want to help. So and so, maybe my empathy is because I did 25 missions, uh, 25 missions from there. But man, they're gonna look after you. They are the best in the business. They got no egos, and they're always trying to tease out the best expertise. It's a great organizational model. Now, so COSTAR is the way we fixed for the wrong mirror in the telescope. There's an American engineer taking a shower in, uh, in Munich, Germany. And for the most part in the US, you can change the stream or point the stream, but a lot of places in Europe, you can move on articulating arms. You move the whole shower head somewhere else. He's, that's why I'm gonna fix Hubble. So it came up with COSTAR, and that's five pairs of little quarter-sized mirrors that come out. One of them catches the aberrated light, corrects it, sends it to its paired mirror, down to another instrument. One box in there. We fixed the aberrated light for uh, for five other instruments. The solar panels were terrible things. They shook so bad. They go in the sunlight and expand. They shook the whole telescope. And they went in the cold side and contracted. They shook the telescope. We were losing 20 or 30 minutes of fine pointing every rev because the solar panels were shaking so bad. Well, what's with the solar panels shaking? They're shaking because they weren't tested in the sun. Solar panel, <laughs> sun, they weren't tested in the sun. You can't do that. So this one's broke. You see it fractured itself. We had to leave it out there. Just drop and leave it fly away. Uh, so, but very, very few surprises. Just tells you how good the team was. I went to close the big doors. The left door's about three inches higher than the right door. The doors are like this so the latches wouldn't match up. They had a difficult time on the ground too, but they didn't warn us. You know, the doors didn't close, so, but I had to come along. I had two come-alongs, you know come-alongs back on the farm, big straps, you tie your, your payload down. Well, I put two come-alongs on the shuttle to close shuttle doors, but I checked with a flight director, and uh, Milt Heffern looked after us, we got it done. So, you know, this is back in 1993, you know, and over the last uh, 19 years, what Hubble's done. So I lost my baby, and we're talking to Clinton, it's a sense of melancholy, sadness, I didn't come for the victory. I came to be in a playing field working, doing the best I could, you know. But I lost my baby. After 18 years, she's gone. I'm not getting back. So it's sadness. A quick celebration of zero G and Earth, I will come right home. So I was on Coke and Pepsi Wars. That's my second flight, all astronomy. The cosmic ray telescope, infrared telescope, all that. But Coke, I, I was signed to Coke, so I had Coke. 
And so, you know, you know what Glass Copeland do in zero-G? You think bubbles are going up? Huh? The bubbles going up? No, there's no density gradient at all. I saved one can for me. To get out the Coke, I took a can opener, I threw the whole top of this Coke can off. To look stupid in the video, I'm trying to pour the Coke out of the can. <laughs> but it won't come out. So I got a problem, but I went, yeah. I snapped the can off the Coke, and that's 12 ounces of Coke. <laughs> there, Jay. So, you know, you put a straw in there, it's flat Coke, bubbles up your nose, it's not going well, and it's getting big now. Because the bubbles are getting big. I spun the coke up, see. So now I got centrifuge in itself. Bubbles up in those flat. You put the coke right down the line here. Best coke in the universe down the line. Okay, quick look at Mother Earth. There's the pyramids in space. Yeah, and so that's 600 millimeter lens. You can't see the pyramids themselves, not enough contrast, but you can see the shadows. So that, you know, that's a very high sun angle I have. But at low sun angle, you have shadow go out for a mile. You can't see the shadows and the contrast. There's Mount Everest, tallest mountain. And here's uh, Mount, Mount Olympus, Greece, and Mount of the Gods, the incredible blue Bahamas, richest blues on Earth. That hurricane's going this direction because it's in the southern hemisphere. Coriolis doing the other thing. We'll take a sunset, come home. Space sunset, glorious. This is just outrageous at night. So you've got Sicily and you've got Italy, a classical boot. And uh, the Greek islands are uh, off to the right. And the Nile, the Nile River is unbelievably bright. So the Aswan Dam ends the lights. Now right there, but of course Alexandria up on the left and Cairo is the bright. And you see over there the Haifa and, uh, and Tel Aviv. But, uh, and here's the Suez Canal, you see, running off there. But that's a night view. And then the aurora comes. And that's what it looks like. And it sweeps, it just sweeps. Because nothing moves, you know, it's like a wave in water. And so it'll sweep over a thousand miles and you fly right through it. You know, so you have to take your time, dark adapt and shut everything down. I really take this experience. With that, we gotta come home. Incredible flying machine, in this case, into Florida. You think of all the people who did it right. They were professionals, took you on a journey and they, uh, they took you home, took you home safe. I thought, turn around and go again. How's Hubble doing? That's before I fixed it, and that's after I fixed it. <clears throat> and so, yeah. Well, that's just wide field planetary camera. I just uh, installed it the way I had planned over all those years. But so this wide field planetary camera came out of JPL right here. And so Mike Massimino, incredible spacewalker, uh, he was on STS-125, but my procedures and my tools lasted the next four missions, except for things that I didn't know about, uh, my tools, and it lasted the next uh, four seasons. And so uh, there's the space station, you see, only the shuttle could have put that together. We're very, very good at doing things uh, like that, but you do know the trade, you knew the trade the space station is. The trade is we could have had 200 Voyagers, we could have had Voyager class satellites on every moon of every planet and on every planet. So you make that trade. But I, in terms of exploration, I think we lost. We gained a lot in terms of operations in space, but exploration is what the public really needs and wants. So I think we lost in terms of exploration. Here's a beautiful look at the sunlight behind here. Now here's space station moving across the sun. So we have a solar eclipse. So the moon is about 20 minutes beyond the peak, moving in this direction. And there's, uh, uh, there's the, the space station moving across the sun. These are the sunspots you see right there. So the shuttle program has ended, and I got some uh, pictures of the Enterprise uh, moving into New York City. I've got pictures of the other ones as they go out into the world. Uh, so the Chrysler Building, the old Pan Am, symbolic for flight. Now, Central Park, this is outrageous stuff. And so, just beautiful what is going on. It's going to end up on the Intrepid down here. So it was picked off at a carrier at uh, JFK here, and it took a barge around, and up, that's the Veranzo Narrows Bridge. Now, this is outrageous stuff. This is, this is outrageous. Uh, this is what you and I do. This is what we do uh, right here. So up to Hudson with uh, people of interest. And to have this juxtaposition of, of regional life and a, and a spaceship going by, 
It's just outrageous. But remember my message. Remember my message in terms of vision. Vision to the public has got to be communicated like this. So powerful and compelling that they can't resist it. And pressure from bottom up is going to let us get there. And so here's the crane picking it up off the barge and setting it down on the Intrepid. Ironically, it's the same train that picked up Miracle of Hudson, that picked up U.S. Airways uh, out, of, out of the Hudson. Uh, so that is that. And now we get to the space station with uh, an incredible soy. They know what they're doing. It's over. It's 46 years old. Still does what it does. Here's Tracy, Tracy Caldwell Dyson. So I'm just going to follow one person through the journey with, uh, with, with Soyuz. And there's Tracy in the cupola, a great uh, kind of view out there. And here she comes home in the field. And of course, uh, they're going to ignite the solid rocket booster. The cushion, cushions are landing. It looks primitive, but doggone it, it works. And a picture I absolutely adore. She's in the kilo helicopter <laughs> on, the way, on the way home. And despite all the attention she's getting, she's saying, man, after six months up there, I just got to take a break. I just, uh, I love that. I think it's uh, really compelling. And so the future, uh, so um, the Spaceship One, uh, Virgin Galactic, Taurus. And uh, uh, so there's the Dream Chaser, Sierra Nevada. So we're going to develop, and uh, you know well about uh, the Dragon. They already brought cargo up there, and uh, CST-100 by the Boeing company, and Orion, the NASA one. We are paying for and developing five different ways, including the Russians, to get to low Earth orbit. Uh, so, you know, you'll have to wonder, is that the right thing to do to pay for five different systems? And we are paying for it now. Uh, so it's all about my human space flight. So I'm going to end up here. This incredible Earth, floating ocean of space, the only home we'll ever have get along with the rest of the species. And that's a single photograph, as you know, the, the Voyager took the two sisters, Moon and Earth, and the Hubble picture of where we're going. And the Cassini, and you can see Mother Earth. You see Earth right above, a foot above my finger. They're trying to take a picture of Saturn, but they got Mother Earth, and that's what it's about. It's a beautiful sun. Star birth in Orion, Monocerotes, probably end up in supernova. And we got supernova 1994, you see the supernovas there, the artists, the kind of art they produce out there is just outrageous beauty. You got the Veil Nebula. Uh, so we got 4414, and we got, no, that was Silverado, 4414, and the Sombrero. As you well know, the deep field, we took Hubble, aimed at where there was nothing. We thought dark sky, we took a long exposure, it's another 1,000, 2,000 galaxies, maybe 300 trillion stars. And one picture, that's the kind of home, beautiful place we got. So that's you and I. That's the Milky Way galaxy. That is our home that you're looking at right there. And one of the huge triumphs, the Voyagers, as you know, have left the solar system 34 years. One of them took a picture of Mother Earth from 5 billion miles. So that's us. We're on a cosmic journey. The accretion disk, the dust plane that formed our solar system, the sun, the planets, and you and I. What can you say, story? Walter Cronkite, what do you say, story? Three things. I am privileged to have gone. You know, to many people, I'm mean, privileged to be on that playing field, to have the opportunities and the kind of challenges that I have. Secondly, I was allowed to finish. I could have been stopped. I could have run into an insurmountable surprise that would have stopped me cold. I was allowed to get the job done. And thirdly, and most important is, it is not over. Space flight is the quest for the universe. It's what is our place in it, the meaning of the hope that we got here. And so, with your feet in the ground, your head in your heart, in the heavens, uh, we go forward. I wish you well in that quest, calm seas, fair winds, and remember, we go simply because it is there.